Wizards starts the week off strong, banning every card ever made. Every single Eternal format has a change. 16 different cards, plus a rules change. We got a lot to cover today. Steven with Magic Man of Money, thanks for tuning in. Because there's so much to cover, I'm just going to go ahead and do each different format by itself. And then at the end, I'm going to wrap up and do a little financial discussion. There'll be timestamps below in, in the description. So if you're not interested in a particular format, that's fine. You can skip it. Hope you learn a lot from today. Let's dive on in. First of all, instead of starting with an actual format, we're going to start with Uro because Uro is banned in every format except for Legacy and Vintage. Uro's the big bad beast. No one likes it. It's not fun to play against. Even if you answer it the first time, like in, in an efficient way, even if you counter it or you thought seize it, it doesn't matter. It just comes back. It's an ever looming threat. It's very repetitive. It's very boring. It's very powerful. No one likes playing against it over and over again. I think there's been enough said about Uro. I don't want to spend too much time on it today, but honestly, I think the formats that it's banned in now, which officially is Historic, which we already knew, Pioneer, which we already knew, Modern, which we already knew, all of this was announced in the Secret Lair last week. It's banned everywhere, and I think all formats are better off for it. It's just not fun to play against. And, and one of the biggest things is it really, even if it's not necessarily the power level, it's just that it's it effectively bans so many other fair cards. I mean, why would you play Jund, right? Like, if you're not playing blue and you're not playing Uro, you're, you're just not playing the good mid-range game. So even if you wanna play the fight the fair fight, play a fair game, just not playing Uro puts you at a disadvantage. So not only does Uro fit in a lot of different types of decks, right? Control, you know, combo for some reason, they like to put it in there, mid-range. The fact is, is not only is it so widespread, it also is just the best option to be doing, right? It's just the best color format. It's just the best color combo and the best threat. It's so diverse and powerful. I think that's enough to talk about it. I think we're all better off that it's gone. It did not get banned in Legacy Noted. You know, they said, hey, we're thinking about it still, but they said, you know, we, we, it probably isn't. And officially, no, it is not. Still legal in Legacy. Uh, by the idea being the bar for three and four mana spells is so high, you know, I mean, hey, you could cast Uro or you could cast Show and Tell for three mana, right? That, that's the idea, I think. So the Legacy says the format's so powerful as a whole, we're going to let it stay. That's fine, whatever. Jumping to Pioneer, we have Ballastrad Spy Band, Undercity Informer Band, Teferi Time Reveler Band, Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath Band, and lastly, Wilderness Reclamation Band. Ballastrad Spy and Undercity Informer both banned, and they both deserve it. They're both part of the Oops All Spells deck, both part of the deck of Oops, did nobody have fun? Let's move on to game two. You know, it's not fun to play the deck, it's not fun to play against the deck, it's just very boring and repetitive, it's just simply, we cast this spell, it resolves, I win, mill my whole library. Now the problem, was the problem here the spell lands from Zendikar Rising? I don't think so. I think those were great designs. Th they just happened to have a bad interaction and that's gonna happen in Eternal Formats. We, we know that, that's just the nature of designing new cards, especially modal double face cards and really going new directions in design philosophy. Naturally, that's going to have bad implications with a game as vast as Magic. There's millions of cards, uh, not millions of different cards, but you know, tens of thousands of different cards just such a big diverse game naturally there's going to be some un, you know non-fun design overlap right and and, and un, unfortunate interactions with different cards if you look at magic's design philosophy over the last few years rules changes design everything the whole idea is they're trying to reduce the number of non-games that happen right if you look at the new mulligan rules that's all trying to say hey let's make mulligans less damaging so, no, so you don't have one person mulling to four and losing uh, cards being designed to have more flexibility you know being powerful in the early game as well as the late game you know mana sinks so that way you don't if you get flooded there's something you can do all of this their overall theme is to reduce the number of non-games played same with bans and restrictions right they, they're trying to keep the, the games actually playing Right, and, and that two people play at a game of magic, not one person. Exile a Simeon Spirit Guide, we'll get to that in a minute. And then cast to Vault's Trickery, and then the game's over. That was a non-game. Even if there was a winner and a loser, and both people had a function to open seven hands, uh, it was still a non-game. So they're trying to reduce that, and these spell lands from Zendikar Rising are a great way to do that. Right? To be able to have hit your land drops and have spells to avoid mana screw and mana flood, it's great. 
I, mean, I think we're going to see these more and more and more uh, in the future. And uh, yes, it fits with Zendikar because Zendikar is all about the lands and landfall and man lands and everything like that. I think they'll break that out into be other into other planes, and we'll see modal double face cards that have a spell and a land on one side on each on one side uh, in the future. Will they make some that are probably too powerful? Sure, that might happen. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But it's a great design, and unfortunately, it happened to make oops all spells a deck and not fun at all. Not going to talk about Uro, just did, but in conjunction with Teferi Time Raveler, interesting to see them both get banned together because both of these are obviously part of the Niv the Niv to Light deck and. This deck is probably still going to be really powerful, but it is nice to reduce. I mean, Teferi Time Rattler, not a fun card to play against. It just does too much for three mana, and it also just reduces interaction in such a strong, powerful way of, of not being able to cast spells at instant speed. That's the problem with it. If you took that static ability away, it would still be a playable card. In my, I think so. Uh, but the fact that you play that and then no one can interact with it, you can't even kill it right away on their turn. I mean, it's, it's just didn't work doesn't work with shutting down instant speed spells so good to see it go and then that with uro yes this will reduce the power level of niv to light this is still going to be the deck to beat the mid-range deck you know it's still going to be really powerful my goal on pioneer is to make siege rhino great again i know people who played back in the day with theros and khan say hey siege rhino are you kidding me that was the boogeyman no one loved siege rhino well wouldn't you love to have the games be about Siege Rhino now when you're talking about Pioneer and Modern? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't that be fun to have a four drop big dumb creature hit the battlefield and yes, have a good ETB ability and then die to removal, you know, and it got some value in there? Compare that to Uro, huh? Is Siege Rhino really that bad? Maybe those were the glory days. Maybe those were the good old days. Is Siege Rhino going to be a better deck, you know, a better mid range deck than Niv to Light? Uh, probably not. But. At least this does reduce the power level of Nidalai. I think it's going to make it more fun. Great bans. Happy with these. Wilderness Reclamation. Interesting they just said, hey, we're going to preemptively ban this. We know that as we reduce these other decks, this is the next one. I think the same thing happened before with Standard, right? I think they, they, were, they were banning a different card, if I remember correctly. And they said, hey, we're going to preemptively ban uh, Wilderness Reclamation as well. Did that happen? I can't remember. Something similar happened. There's been so many band announcements over the last few years, it's really hard to keep track of them. But it's interesting they just went ahead and said, hey, we recognize this card's going to be next. It's, people aren't going to like it. It's going to increase you know, dramatically the metagame share, and it just does too much. It makes so much mana. It's just absolutely bonkers, especially the fact that you, it's a trigger, so you can tap all your mana and untap it and cast an instant speed spell at, on your end step with double your mana right not like it's already strong enough to say hey i'm gonna play this on my play mana on my turn and get the same amount of mana on your turn but the fact that you can do it all at once is crazy the fact that it untaps the mana the, the turn that it comes into play so you get to play it for free is crazy uh, I, great ban the card does a lot we've seen it been too powerful and standard and i think it makes sense to get rid of it now for modern we have field of the dead being banned hallelujah mystic sanctuary being banned thank you so much simeon spirit guide being banned about time, man, has that lived on borrowed time for a long time. Tabalt's Trickery being banned, and of course, Uro being banned. Uro, goodbye, no sadness here. Field of the Dead and Mystic Sanctuary. Seeing two different lands get banned, awesome. Uh, I, I think we all know part of the reason why these are getting banned, of course, is because of fetch lands, which is why Pioneer should be such a great format, because there are no fetch lands that create so many problems for the game. No, they'll never be banned in Modern Legacy. That's fine. Uh, they shouldn't be whatever. They're there. They exist. But it's so nice to have an, a, an eternal format without fetch lands because they create so many issues. And so, yes, you could say these, fee these cards are getting banned because of the fetch lands. I don't care. I'm just glad they're gone. Mystic Sanctuary, extremely repetitive to play against, and the particular, the fact that you're playing against the same spell over and over again, and at the small cost because they can just go get it with fetch lands, so you turn your your lands into spells, not fun. I know I just talked about lands and spells, you know, having both on one card makes the gameplay a little better because you avoid mana screw and mana flood, but this is different. We all, we all know this is different, where every single fetch land can be turned into a spell, particularly with Cryptic Command so that you can rebuy the, the Mystic Sanctuary, bad interaction, bad gameplay, super repetitive, no sadness to see that go. Field of the Dead, I'm ecstatic. Literally just the other day I was thinking, man, I really, really hope Field of the Dead gets banned. When we saw that Uro was going to get banned in every format and you know everyone's wheels started turning to say, hey, what else is going to be banned? 
Field of the Dead, I would rather play against Wasteland. I would rather have Wasteland be legal in modern than Field of the Dead. And people who watch Legacy and play Legacy, you might feel like, oh, you know, Wasteland is a card and you're used to it. No, it is broken, it's disgusting, it's not a good card to have in a format, but I would rather have that than Field of the Dead. No joke. The fact that Field of the Dead is just, again, low cost, just put a couple in your library and then every land turns into this incredible defense and offense and this inevitability that's hard to interact with and not fun. Good riddance. It's not a fun card. It's been banned in other formats for a reason. I'm really happy to see this one go. And yes, I know I'm biased because I play fair decks and that's it is what it is. Let's get rid of it. Tybalt's Trickery not fun it's just a combo deck that's not fun to play against it's a total non-game either way you either instantly lose or instantly win as you just goldfish against an opponent who's doing nothing because they had mulligan to four or you had the one thought seize or inquisition or the one counter spell to interact with it so either way it's a non-game it's either a non-game lose or a non-game win makes sense to get rid of it Speaking of Tybalt's trickery, Tybalt causing some issues here with Cascade and the way it interacts with you being able to Cascade into the front side and then cast the back side. Doesn't make any sense. It's not really intuitive, but it is the way it works with modal double face cards. So there's a rules change with Cascade. I'll bring it up here, show it on the screen here. But effectively, all it's saying is, hey, you know, Cascade, you exile the top card of your library until you find a card with the lesser converted mana cost. And now in order to cast that card, not only did you find that card, in order to cast it, it also has, has to have a lesser CMC than the card before, than the cascading card. So effectively this just means, hey, you can't cascade into a two drop on the front side and then cast a seven drop on the back side. That's great news. So this rules change is big. Uh, it's a lot better than banning all these cascade cards. Now personally, you got one cascade card that's fine in Bloodbraid Elf. Again, here comes my bias, obviously. I'm, let's make Jun great again. Uh, and then you have a whole bunch of Cascade spells that are doing broken things. Some people like that, some people don't. Honestly, usually these decks are a small enough percentage of the metagame share and you can interact with them and they're slow enough. Living End and other things you can play against, so it's fine, whatever, I don't care. I'm just glad this rule exchange is corrected so you can't then cost, cast seven drops uh, on turn two. And how did you do that on turn two? Simeon Spirit Guide, which is banned, and wow, has this been living on borrowed time. Simeon Spirit Guide, I thought would be banned like five years ago from Modern. I mean, this card has always been a problem. It's always been a, has this card ever been like a fair, fun card? Has this, or has this card always been part of combo decks, right? The, the what a, free mana not good right we know that there's a reason lotus petal isn't isn't in modern and for some reason simian spirit guide is didn't make sense i'm glad it's gone it just sped up combo decks too fast made the deck made the game shorter and compact more compact good riddance should have been banned years ago finally did we'll see you later for Legacy, we have Arkham's Astrolabe, Dreadhorde Arcanist, and Oko Thief of Crowns all banned. These are all great moves. Uh, the Dreadhorde Arcanist really caught me by surprise because it is just a two-drop creature that has a full turn to interact with before it does anything. I found that really interesting. You know, if you think about it, it kind of compares to like Jace Vin's Prodigy, right? JVP was a super, super strong card, and, but I felt that it would never be banned because it died to removal you know, died to every type of removal that could interact. It was it was two, a two drop, not a one drop. It gives you some time to interact with it. You know, every, even if you're on the, even if the opponent is on the draw, right? So you played on turn two, they have their turn one mana to interact with it and their turn two to interact with it before it does anything, before it gets your first loot. Uh, same thing with Dreadhorde Arcanist. So I was a little surprised to see this one go, but honestly, I don't play like a lot of Legacy anymore. So not really up in tune with it. The fact that they just said, hey, uh, it's it's too early, the game's too focused around it, because once it once it attacks once and gets you a, a ponder back or a brainstorm back, the game kind of ends from there. And and I bet the data really show that. I bet the fact that, you know, it's not about can you interact with it, it's probably about the fact that one attack is enough of an advantage to just win the game at that point, because Legacy is so powerful. You're getting free mana, you're getting free card selection. I mean, all of that just from one attack, Plus it's still a threat. It's a slow threat with only one power, but it's still a threat. I think it makes sense, so cool. I, I was a little surprised, but I'm sure they have data to back this up. Arkham's Astrolabe, 
We've seen this card be too powerful. Uh, it just does too much. It replaces itself. It's only one mana, and then it just protects you. It makes rainbow decks easy. Uh, it protects you from Blood Moon or Wasteland. So the fact that you get this opportunity to have, you know, all the mana in the world without any of the downside of having, you know, complex lands. Now in Legacy, obviously the dual lands have pretty much no downside other than they can't. They're not basic, so they can't be destroyed by Wasteland. But the main idea here is, of course, you either need to trade off. You either need to have bad mana or few colors, right? And Arkham's Astrolabe prevented that from happening. It's a fundamental part of magic. Oko Thief of Crowns, I will always remember when I opened Oko Thief of Crowns in like an MTGO uh, preliminary qualifier or something. And all right, I went five and zero without even really trying. I mean, I, I happened to see the card in like quite a bit. I, you know, I, I drafted, I opened it in a sealed pool and, and happened to build a good deck around it and see it quite a bit. I drew the card a little bit. Every single time I saw it, it won the game by itself. That's obviously limited. We're now talking about legacy, basically two opposite ends of the spectrum here. But again, it's just too powerful. It just does too much. Uh, it's too consistent with threat. It does, it's an, it's an answer. It's a threat. It's everything. Good to see it go. It's just really, really prevalent in legacy. You see it everywhere. So good to see it banned. Moving on to Vintage, Lurus of the Dream Den is now unbanned. This is interesting because, you know, Vintage doesn't ban cards, they restrict them. You know, the whole idea of Vintage is that you get to play with every card ever, but to make it still a format that you can actually play and have it function, you can't have four Black Lotuses, four Every Mox, etc. And you're thinking, well, who can afford that anyway? Online, those cards are actually pretty cheap, so you can play Vintage online, it's not that expensive. The Mox is the Power 9, it, it, they're not that expensive. But to make it a functioning format, you only get one copy, they restrict things. Now, why they don't restrict cards in other formats is beyond me. Uh, I think that would do so much, it would open up so much to say, hey, we're not gonna ban these cards outright, we're not gonna say, hey, sorry all of you who bought these cards, we're banning them forever, and now you can only play with them in Commander. I think it'd be so much better to say you get one copy and maybe they don't do that because of potentially cheating right because you could say hey well now that i'm allowed to play one copy i'm actually going to put three or four in my deck and you know hope i don't get deck checked or whatever i don't know i don't know why they don't do this i'm sure there are reasons that i've just i'm overlooking anyway i think restricting is a great idea but with vintage because it was a companion you only needed one copy for it to just come in on turn three or turn two or turn one, right? It's vintage, you got all the mana in the world, uh, and then just start getting your mana back, right? You cast it with Black Lotus, get your Black Lotus back. Obviously, that's a really broken play pattern. Uh, that got banned instantly. It got banned faster than the rules companion change, right? So th because there's the, the change in rules where you say, now, now you have to pay three mana, that companion tax, in order to get it from your sideboard or your companion zone into your hand, they said, all right, let's give it a shot. Let's let it play. Whatever, it's vintage, no one cares. For Historic, Omnath is now officially banned. It was suspended. It was on its little timeout. Uro, though, they skipped the, the timeout stage. They didn't say, we're going to suspend you. They just said, we're banning you. Goodbye, Uro, you're gone. I think that's great. Uh, I don't play a lot of Historic or any Historic, honestly. I don't really watch it either. Uh, I've been watching a little bit, you know, during this last season since they have made it more competitive and, and everything and, and the focus of tournaments. But Historic is what Historic is. Uro stinks. Omna stinks, good riddance. Finally here, wrapping up the video, talking about the money side of things. What is this gonna do? Overall, it's gonna shake up prices a lot, sure. And you know we're gonna see all these cards obviously go down in value, in price. But what's interesting is that we're gonna see a lot of other cards spike, right? This is gonna shake up all these formats by quite a bit. Who knows what cards are gonna spike? And that's what I wanna talk about today, the idea of there's just so many variables you know, you could call them black swan events, whatever you want to talk about, just unprecedented events to say, hey, who knew that all of a sudden this card would spike or all of a sudden this card would get banned? You know, Dreadhorde Arcanist, right? Like who predicted that would get banned? Probably not a lot of people. You know, you compare that to like predicting Uro getting banned, right? Like there's way different, right? So, so there's so many variables that can cause a card to just jump up or sink in price that honestly, you just need to, buy singles to play with them. If it's not on the restricted list, it's gonna get reprinted, so you already know there's a glass ceiling on the price there. They say, oh, card reached 50, 60, 70 bucks? All right, we're gonna reprint that in the next set. We already know that's what they do. Uh, it's very obvious. Uh, and lastly, you know, it, but then the other side is, hey, when cards get banned, all of a sudden they tank in value. So specking on singles, 
not something I'm interested in, not something that I recommend people doing. I mean, people, some people do it for fun. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, if you're doing it for fun and it's a very small percentage of your portfolio, okay, like that, that's fine. You know, it's like when people do a little bit of stock, individual stock picking with like 5% of their portfolio. You can do that. But if this is your main strategy of investing, or within your magic portfolio, singles are your main your main strategy of, of investing. I don't recommend that. It's really, really risky, uh, especially when you have a third party, right? You have wizards who can just come in at any time and just slap you with a ban and just boom. All of a sudden you had, uh, you know, you had 100 copies of Uro, you had 100 copies of Dreadhorde Arcanist, and all of a sudden banned tanks, right? Now, whether you're doing this with magic online copies, digital copies, or with paper copies, you see the risk here. That's what I want to talk about today. You know, yes, will Oko being banned and Uro being banned, and will these affect these sealed box prices a little bit? Of course, in the long term, uh, the fact that now Theros, literally, no matter what format you play, except for Commander, if you now open Uro, if you're not playing Commander Legacy, it's just an unplayable card. Yeah, that's bad news for Theros Beyond Death. The, you know, that's pretty obvious. Those sealed boxes are, are going to have a real slow growth. They'll probably still grow because all sealed boxes do. You know, they grow at least a little bit, right? Even Dragon's Maze, $100 a box, watch out. You never know when it's going to go to 105. Be careful, everyone. But seriously, these it's not going to grow a ton, I think. I think it's pretty limited here with the best card and set being banned in every format. But there's still some cool, it's still a fun format to draft. The limited, the sealed was really fun. So, you know, people might still want to open it in the future. And it's Theros. It has the awesome, awesome gods and, and the, the Greek mythology. So it has that going for it. But the biggest, you know, the most powerful, most expensive car being banned in every format, obviously, you know, a little bit of a problem for it. Oko banned in every format already, so Throne of Eldraine was already not really, you know, feeling the love from Oko. It already had some other cards banned as well, and it is what it is. Yes, now it's banned in Legacy. Not going to really be a huge ding in the future. This, this format is this set was so fun so iconic so cool with the collectors and the alternate frames and the adventure cards and you know again talk about reducing the uh, the number of non-games and increase the fact that you get threats and answers all in one card awesome we'll see adventure creatures printed again in another set or maybe we'll return to throne or to eldraine or whatever i don't know but we'll see adventures again I don't think this is going to make it too much. It's not going to do really that much to, for these box prices moving forward uh, because the card was already banned in like every format that was really playable. You know, most people don't have access to Legacy, right? It's it's price prohibited because of the, the dual lands. War of the Spark getting Teferi Time Raveler banned in Pioneer. Yep, that'll affect it a little bit, but not much. I don't think the price of this card is suddenly going to plummet. It might go down 10, 20, 30%. Nothing too crazy. You know, it's still legal in Modern and it's the, the set as a whole it's still War of the Spark. It's still where you get to open it, you draft it, or you do sealed pools with your friends, and you all get a bunch of Planeswalkers, and it's a whole bunch of fun. I don't think it's going to do much, honestly. Not too worried about that. Again, as time goes on, the EV of the box doesn't necessarily matter. It's more about the supply and the demand. Um, it's not The price of the box really isn't determined by the EV. So not too worried about, about War of the Spark here. Overall, takeaway, you never know what's going to happen with... with singles it's really risky to invest in singles if you want to do it and you think it's fun keep it as a really small percentage of your portfolio and you make sure that you protect your downside all of a sudden you could have 16 cards get banned or unbanned and changed and format shakeups and it's going to happen again in three months and you just never know there's too many variables thanks for tuning in we'll see you next time